Battleline Podcast, Ian Scotto here, and I have to acknowledge first and foremost that this week, not necessarily today when you're hearing this, unless you happen to be hearing it on the day, uh, is Veterans Day. And as always, I mean, this, this show appreciates and celebrates the great veterans that protect this country. And uh, this is your day to, to enjoy with friends, with family, barbecue, all that good stuff, while uh, us civilians appreciate your sacrifice and uh, and what you did in your service. And the, uh, selfishly, I also have to acknowledge that 11-11 uh, marks two years of doing Battleline Podcast. And when Chris and I started this, uh, we really had no idea where it would go. It was just a authentic connection that, that we decided to uh, to go this path. And Chris is someone I've known for years. And it just organically happened. We organically started this thing and it's taken off. And, and that's thanks to you guys. And also thanks to the support of our sponsors, our great sponsors. Now, uh, Chris is out this episode, but this is an awesome interview that I got to do with Frank Bello from Anthrax, a guy I've been a fan of for years. But to be honest, I wasn't planning on interviewing him, but I learned a little bit more about the book, which you'll hear about. And the book truly represents some of the things that we talk about on this show, uh, perseverance and really triumphing over any tragedy and uh, having faith to, to carry through. And, and you're going to hear that in this interview. So I, I think whether you're a fan of Anthrax or whether you're not even familiar with them, you're going to really enjoy this interview. Now, uh, before we get into everything, uh, Ned keeps us going you know, all the time. Uh, we've They've been with us for a very long time now on this show, nearly since the beginning. I, I normally talk about some of my experiences with CBD, with uh, full-spectrum hemp, but I'm going to start this show actually with an email that I got from one of our listeners sent to battlelinepodcast at gmail.com because it, it really demonstrates how Ned is helping people's lives and how CBD is great and that they're making the purest CBD out there and uh, putting these products out. So I'm just going to read this to you guys verbatim, sent to uh, battlelinepodcast at gmail.com. Chris and Ian, I wanted to take an opportunity and thank you for making me aware of the great products from Ned. I grew up in the 70s and had the mindset of if I can climb it, jump it, or fall from it, I was going to give it a shot. Add that to many years in the Marine Corps and law enforcement, and you have the perfect storm for some serious joint pain and inflammation after hitting my 50s. Wow. I have tried some CBD products in the past and had absolutely no results. I heard mention of Ned on your podcast and decided to look them up. I was impressed with what I discovered and decided to give it a shot. I think it's important to say here that I was extremely skeptical that I would have any results. About 35 days after taking the full spectrum CBD, I sincerely started seeing results. I would have severe inflammation flare-ups in my knees and hips, and I'm happy to say I have had major reduction in inflammation and major improvements with flexibility. I cannot recommend the product enough. On behalf of my wife, kids, and grandkids, we all thank you for the activities we can now enjoy together. Semper Fi, Marine Corps veteran Clem, from Pensacola, Florida. That really says it for you. Um, any of you thinking of trying CBD who may be experiencing some of those issues, but it's also, of course, great for, for sleep, antidepressant. For me, I, I think the main thing I've really used it for is sleep. And uh, you, know, you, you take that and it's not habit forming, but you're gonna have dreams and you're gonna feel the difference between your normal sleep and then your sleep in that delta state when you take uh, CBD, when you take full spectrum hemp from Ned, because all of their full spectrum hemp is extracted from USDA certified organic hemp plants in Paonia, Colorado. And then as I've said before, they do have a new distress blend, which is a one, one formula of CBD and CBG, which is known as the mother of all cannabinoids. And uh, we have a great offer for you guys that you'll be able to check out. So Ned shares third-party lab reports, who farms their products, and their extraction process all right there on their site. And if you want to try the new Distress Blend from Ned, a brand that we love and trust and guys like Clem love and trust, we have a special offer for you guys. Every order over $40 qualifies for 15% off plus a free Distress Blend sample. 
Go to helloned.com slash battleline or enter battleline at checkout to take advantage of this offer. That's H E L L O N E D dot com slash battleline to get 15% off plus a free distress blend sample on any order over $40. Thank you, Ned, for sponsoring our program and offering our listeners a natural remedy for some of life's most common health issues. Additionally, our show is sponsored by our great friends at Audible, and which is perfect for this episode because as of tomorrow, if you're listening to this on Monday, the book that you're about to hear about, Frank Bellow's book, uh, which is Fathers, Brothers, and Sons Surviving Anguish, Abandonment, and Anthrax, that's going to be available on Audible, and through us, you'll be able to hear it for free. So check this out. Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment all in one place. At Audible, you can find the largest selection of audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers and new releases to celebrity memoirs, languages, business, motivation, and more, like original entertainment from top celebrity creators and thousands of popular and binge-worthy podcasts, all from one app. And uh, I'm looking forward to checking out Frank Bellow's Audible because he reads it. So with Audible, you can always find the perfect title for whatever you're doing, wherever you're going, or whatever you're feeling. Audible allows you to find audiobooks that will inspire, delight, help, or simply entertain you. With Audible, you can listen while working from home, cooking, exercising, on a walk, as a family activity, or just relaxing. And now, with the new Plus catalog, an Audible membership is so much more valuable as it gives all members a chance to listen to and discover new favorites in new formats, like the exclusive Words Plus music series or a podcast you never considered before. With the free Audible app on your smartphone or tablet, you can download titles and listen offline anytime, anywhere. Audible can help people with their own personal goals, whether they want to learn something new, get more books in their life while doing other things, focus on mind and body wellness, or simply enjoy a well-deserved diversion. You can set your own goals and let Audible help you reach them. New members can always try Audible for free for 30 days, so you have nothing to lose. So join me on my Audible adventure. You will always be able to find the perfect title for you. So check this out. Simply visit battlelinepodcast.com slash audible. That's battlelinepodcast.com slash A-U-D-I-B-L-E. That link is in the description. And through that, you'll be able to check out for free for that 30-day trial the new Frank Bellow book, which once again is Fathers, Brothers, and Sons, Surviving Anguish, Abandonment, and Anthrax. And I have a feeling that after you hear this interview, you're really going to want to learn more. So check it out, battlelinepodcast.com slash audible. With that, I realized when I started the interview, I didn't say the switch is on, and that is the trademark of the show. Uh, that's the catchphrase. So I'm saying it now. The switch is on, motherfucker. Let's get this thing started. From Omaha, Nebraska to New York City, from planet Earth to extraterrestrial life in space, a podcast with no equal, engaged in unconventional warfare through your speakers and headphones. This is a show about embracing the suck, conquering your demons, and finding God in the face of adversity. Chris Tonto Peranto. Twitch is on. Motherfucker, I'm going to shoot you in the face. Ian Scotto. You know, Ian and I have been dating for a long time. <laughs> You are now tuned into the Battle Line Podcast. So joining me for the first time on Battleline Podcast is Frank Bello, bassist for Anthrax, and now the author of Fathers, Brothers, and Sons, Surviving Anguish, Abandonment, and Anthrax, which just came out. Anthrax is, is celebrating 40 years, and the crazy thing is, 
I, I have to say, and, and I already know we haven't even done anything yet, but th I, this is going to fly by because Anthrax is a band who has truly been a part of my life during different milestones, really from, I would say, 2000 to now. And, you know, all the lineup changes and all the different landmark events that you've had. So I'm just, I'm really thrilled to be doing this and honored that you would join me. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks for having me. You know, it, it's it's a different thing for me. I've never done a book before. Used to doing this stuff with the albums and records and all that good stuff. But um, it's a different world. This is a completely different world when you're talking about your own being, you know, your own life and kind of stripping your 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 soul away. You really, really you leave everything out there. It, it's kind of cathartic, but at the same time, I was really nervous like a couple of days before the book came out, to be honest, because I didn't leave anything out off the table. Everything was on the table there. Probably some stuff I probably should have kept to myself, but it's done. <laughs> I, I mean, I realized that because the reason I reached out to Alexandra and I, uh, your publicist, and I have to say she got back so quickly, was I'm always driving around listening to different things. I listen to Eddie Trunk pretty much every day. And typically we have special operations military guys in here because of Chris's background. But every now and again, we have musicians. And when I heard the interview and I heard the story about your brother, which I had no idea of, and I don't think most fans do, I was like, this is a remarkable story. And I think the reason also that you say this is different for you, for me as just an outsider, and maybe you feel differently, the public faces of Anthrax have always been, whether it's Joey Belladonna or John Bush on vocals, Scott Ian always doing his thing on VH1. Charlie Benanti, I feel like, is always up to something different. And, you know, he's he's definitely a public figure type, has has the hot rock star girlfriend. Right. And I feel like of the guys in the classic lineup, you are the guy who's been the more behind the scenes guy and, and not necessarily the face of the band. I like it that way. <laughs> yeah. I'm, look, if you know, you can see me on social media, uh, my publicist, all of them, Anthrax is my book publicist say I should build it up and I should be on it more. I'm not that guy, to be honest. I, I'm a family guy. I like being, I like writing songs here in my basement and I, I, I like playing. I like doing all the stuff, but I like, I like making the music talk. You know, for me, I don't want to, I don't have to see my face. No, look, no offense to anybody who does that. Whatever you want to live your life. This is the way I live mine. I'll get out there. I, pr I have promised I'm going to do a little bit more um, because of the book, of course, but uh, I just, I, I think your your work should be, you know, put out there and, that, and that's it. And I don't have to be in every picture. I'm just not that guy. And, that, and that's fine for me. That's that's the way it works. I'm, I'm not judging anybody else, but uh, I'll, I'll certainly work on that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, yeah, I mean, now that the book is out, I think that it's inevitably going to go that way. And especially because of the fact that you talk about stories that are just amazing, which we'll get into. Uh, that people had no idea of. Um, I, I think I want to start further back, though, especially with Anthrax celebrating 40 years. Sure. Uh, as someone who, who kind of knows the band and, and has listened to you guys for as long as I have, you, re you joined the band once they were signed, but they really were not the Anthrax that we know today. And I would think in those days of the early 80s, getting signed, getting into a band that already had to deal with Megaforce Records, where the trajectory was just amazing to, you know, then sign Metallica and those bands. Did you, did you feel like you made it? I'm in a signed band. No, to tell you the truth, I knew. Look, these were my friends to begin with. I was a roadie technician, whatever you want to call that. But um, I was, I was a guy who hung out with these guys. I was in high school, and I, I love music. I was playing, and I went to hang out with them at the music room, the rehearsal space. And I'm, I was friends with them, and I and then I became this guy that helps change strings, straps, all that good stuff. And um, <clears throat> and I found out they were auditioning bass players, and I auditioned, and I came from my bedroom to thrown into the whole thing. You know, it, it was crazy. And look, these are the times where it's an independent label, no money. There's not a lot of money anywhere. I remember, I remember we went <clears throat> we went on tour. I was making five dollars a day just to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You get five bucks. So that's wow. got to spread a, a long way. And these, these were the best of times, though. Understand it. It's all, it was all a great ride. So what I did in high school, just to go be able to go on tour, once I was in the band, I was 17 years old. I graduated I, double, I graduated early. I doubled up my credits. I, in my school, we were able to double up our credits if I went earlier and left later. So I would double up into one day all my credits. And I got out six months early. I graduated six months early on purpose so I can go on tour with Anthrax. 
So some people thought about college. I went to the College of Anthrax. That's just the way it worked. And, you know, I have to say, from then on, that's my life. It really took on, it really engulfed my whole life. There was no other time for anything else because it was all of us. We were just on this one path, and that was it, tunnel vision to make this band succeed. And, and thankfully, you know, there's a lot of luck involved and a lot of hard work. Um, and, you know, we're, we're still standing at 40 years, so I'm very proud of that. Yeah, how did you even get into that type of music? Because as someone who's a little bit of a music historian myself, that whole thrash scene kind of came out of California. There there really were no, and I know originally from England and all that, those bands like Iron Maiden, who you were influenced by, but I don't think there really was a band in New York that sounded anything like Anthrax. Well, we were all big metal fans, you know, Maiden, Priest, Motorhead, got to remember, you know, and then, then we all came from, remember this, there were also the hardcore roots of New York, where we went to CBGB's on Sundays and listened to the hardcore matinees, which was awesome. That was definitely my big part of uh, the Anthrax sound. So, um, look, I grew up loving heavy music, all music in general, but, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the book a little bit here. It's just getting into the abandonment issue. I had this void. And this void was a, a not a hole in my stomach, and I wanted to fill it. And music, this music specifically, specifically, it filled that void. And there was the angst that I had; it, it satisfied it. That's the best way I could describe it. It like you, you know this music, so you understand that angst that you have in your gut. There was a lot of angst growing up, dad abandoning all that stuff. I had father issues, and you know all that stuff. I grew up with therapy. <clears throat> that. Music made me feel better and, and met that challenge that I said, why? Yes, this is what I feel. This is In music, this is exactly what I feel inside. That's the best way I could describe it. It made me feel better. Yeah, there, there's angst to Anthrax's sound, but I also feel like you were the first band of that genre who also had like a comedy and a lightheartedness to everything that you did. There was always a song on the album that was joking or that would make you laugh. And I feel like all those other great bands like Iron Maiden and Judas Priest, they're very serious. There's nothing funny about it. Well, we wear it on our sleeves. This is the way we grew up. We're, If you know the band Anthrax, the individuals that we are, we're a bunch of ball busters. It's nonstop, <laughs> constant, constant, constant. It's the way we grew up. Maybe it's a New York and thing. That's part of growing up in New York. It's yeah, kind of a New York thing, yeah. And that that's the way we got to know each other. That's the way we bonded as a band. And you're on these, you know, long tour vans. Remember, vans in the early days, everybody band and crew in a small little van smelling everybody's farts, all that great stuff. Remember, <laughs> you have nothing else. There's no bus. There's no big TV bus or anything, you know, TV in the, in the van. You you ball bust. And that's how you, that's your entertainment for that whole, whatever, eight hour, nine hour ride. So um, we grew up on that. And I guess you saw that carry over into our music and into our just have the fun. And look, to be honest, What's better than being on stage? You know, there's no better high. I'm happy and lucky enough to be on stage. I want to enjoy it. And yeah, if I'm smiling on stage, there's a reason for it because I feel like a, mo a lucky motherfucker to do that. That's the truth. Absolutely. And to be doing it as long as you have. We'll, exactly. we'll definitely get into the book and, and your personal story because I think people, whether they're listening to this and they're a fan of Anthrax or not, that's what's going to resonate with them. But just as a nerd for your band, I have to hear about all of these stories. I, I, I'm wondering what it was like when, you know, at one point, uh, Joey Belladonna was no longer in the band and you had to bring someone else in. And to me, you guys created an entirely new sound, especially from what I just said, that there was always a lot of humor to Anthrax, I think. And then Sound of White Noise comes out with this new singer, and, and that humor is kind of gone from the album. It's an entirely serious, entirely aggressive and angry album. It's where we were at at the time. And, you know, life goes on and you, you move to different parts of your life. That's where we were. And, and you know, I consider Anthrax to have two different Anthraxes. It's weird the way I look at it. A lot of people look at it at this point. Uh, the John Bush era, the Joey Belladonna era, I think they're both, I'm a fan. I'm not only just a musician and a writer in the band, I'm a fan of this music and this band. So what I see is we have two really great times in our life, two different singers that just brought something different to each, each record. And I'm still a fan of all their records, you know, all the records they were on. So for me, we're lucky enough to have two different sides of anthrax that's the way i look at it now and it, it's still great consistent great songs and i'm talking as a fan now great, consistent great songs um and it's never lost that intensity 
Uh, yeah. And I, I really, we celebrate both, uh, really. And you talk about 40 years. That was part of the 40 years that I'm very proud of. Um, not a lot of bands can do that. And now we're back with Joey and it's awesome. The, the, the vibe of the band is great internally, all good stuff. Uh, excited about the future. Hopefully one day we can go on a tour. <laughs> you know, and hopefully this we're looking towards next year. We have a tour, a big European tour book next year. Uh, we're hoping for the best. The environment uh, with COVID and stuff dictates that. So uh, we want to we want to come out strong, and we are uh, with a new record and everything. I'm hopefully later next year. But you have played a handful of festivals, and you do yes. have uh, Welcome to Rockville next month, and uh, or this month, I should say, in Daytona month, Beach, Florida. Forward. Sure. Yes, with all these great bands. I mean, Metallica, Leonard Skinner, The Offspring, Rob Zombie, Cypress Hill. Like, it is a stacked lineup, and it is great to be back at shows, and it does feel like normalcy. I just saw – I don't know if you're – I'm all over the place with what I like, but Good. I just saw Born of Osiris last night awesome. uh, here in Patchogue, and it's great to be back at shows, whether they're club shows or I got to see Guns N' Roses at Giant Stadium, and, yeah, I think this is what's been missing for many of us for the Absolutely. past year and a half. You know, it's it's funny because a couple of months back, um, Foo Fighters played the Garden here in New York. In yes. Manchester yeah. Square Garden. I was there. That's before nice. the actual Delta really hit. It was right before the Delta yeah. really hit. And everybody's like feeling better about things. You know, and I, I just want, as a fan, I, I don't want to go backstage. You know, I know the protocols and all that stuff. And I know Dave and all the guys are great. Um, I just enjoyed it as a rock fan. It was such a great show. I just enjoyed it. And I was in the Garden packed beyond belief. It was incredible. Um, the, the set list was great. They were great. I just enjoyed it as a fan and it, made, it brought you back to what you really, why we, why we do this. Not only as a band member, just a music fan. I love this feeling, this vibe, connection with the, with the, with the music, with the band, <clears throat> with the crowd going nuts. I was one of them with my hand up in the air. Yeah. You know, why not? <laughs> why not? And celebrate it. You know, I love that. Well, we're looking, everybody's looking forward now. To, to getting back to it, and I think we will. Um, you know, funny enough, I'm saying I'm saying this as I speak. I have to. Um, I'll be in Rhode Island for one of my appearances for the book on on Sunday. Uh, but one of my favorite bands is pa playing my near my house, 15 minutes from it, like a local theater. That's a great old theater that I love seeing bands in. Cheap Trick, Cheap Trick, one nice. of my all time favorite bands and friends. Uh, we're playing Sunday, and I just looked. I said, "Why Sunday? Why couldn't it be? I'm home Saturday. Why not Monday? You know, it had to be that night. It's one of those." But I, that just shows you how much I'm ready to go out, and I think everybody's ready within reason to be safe and all that stuff. But uh, yeah, uh, uh, we're thankful that we, we have this music in our life. That's for sure. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, uh, absolutely. Um, so getting into where I was, I mean, it's it's kind of going timeline here. I was getting into the '90s, and. Yeah. That And the 90s is when you talked about this story just the other day on Eddie Trunk that I had never heard, which makes up a lot of the book. Um, and I know it's an emotional thing to get into, but the story of what happened to your brother during that time. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of people since have heard the story and uh, come writing into me, which is which is great because I'll, I'll talk to anybody about it because it's traumatic and it still hurts. And it's uh, all, throughout all the therapy. Uh, just for your audience, uh, 1996, two, um, March 25th, 1996, my brother Anthony was murdered uh, in the Bronx, New York. And um, obviously very traumatic, very tough for me and my family. Um, you never really recover from that. You can go as much therapy, you know, you could talk to many friends. You just have to learn how to deal with it. So part of the reason for writing this book is to show there's a lot of people hurting out there is also i it became a point where i became the hunter and i said this on eddie's show um because i want the revenge and i really uh i had tunnel vision right after you know after i saw my my brother under the sheet um and everybody knew who the assailant was the accused assailant um i went hunting and I, you know, I went dark. I'm going to be really honest, as, as honest as I can be. I'm this guy in this metal band that's been pretty okay, successful, and all that stuff. That went away. Nothing mattered. My family went away. I just didn't think about anything anymore. I went dark. I went, and as dark as I've ever been, it kind of scares me to tell you the truth because I didn't know who I was anymore. So I didn't know I had that guy. And I, I never want to see him again, by the way. So at ten, I, pretty much 10 o'clock, 10:30. That was my time every night. 
I went hunting. And I never did this. I never fired a gun in my life. Never was that guy. But all of a sudden, I find myself talking to the wrong people about the wrong things, holding the wrong things in my hand, um, pricing things. And you know what I'm talking about. Um, it just got ugly really fast. And I was ready. It wasn't It wasn't maybe. It was, it was going to happen. So I'm for, I went hunting for two weeks, two straight weeks, 10 o'clock, 1030, patrolling. Didn't find what I wanted to find. And I have to say this, I have to stop it here because while you're patrolling and when you're staked out in your car and you're waiting like this, you start thinking about a lot of things. Why? Why all this stuff? And you reflect. And then you think back about who it's going to affect. And my mom came into my head. Now she just lost a son, her, her younger son, her youngest son. <clears throat> what would happen if I went through with this? This is what came in after two weeks. Uh, what would happen? Look, bottom line is, I think probably retribution, I would have been dead. And this doesn't sound like a tough guy or anything. That's just fact. Retribution, probably, if I would have done what I have done, retribution would have been, you're dead, or at least, very least jail. So either way, and this is what happened after two weeks, started bringing me out of this. What does she deal with? All of a sudden, she loses another son either way. You know, I lose the anthrax thing. I lose the family thing. My girlfriend, who is who's my wife now, I would have lost everything. And then I thought about my brother who would have slapped the hell out of me, just bitch slapped me and said, what the fuck are you thinking? What are you thinking? This is not the way to go. You, mom just lost Mom just lost me. You're not going to be there? What, what is that? And it really pulled me out of it. And really, I got clarity, thankfully, because, dude, um, that's as scary as I've ever been because you, when you, you don't know yourself. That's the scariest place to be. I, I just didn't know who I was. It, all I know is I had a vision, what I had to accomplish. And after years of therapy, made me see the way, all that stuff. And you know, and I, I recommend therapy for anybody who's who goes dark because it, it really it really helps. It really does. And I never thought I'd be that guy, but yeah. So um, it was that. And I never want to go to that place again. So People are finding out about that story. And you have to understand, nobody in my life ever knew about that story because I didn't tell anybody because I was afraid of that person. Um, I didn't tell my wife. My wife didn't know until she read the book, until she wow. read the transcript. My wife didn't know. My family certainly didn't know. My mom didn't know. My mom hasn't read the book yet. I've never told her. She just got the book. I just sent it to her the other day. I had to preface it. I had to call her and say, look, this is what's going on here. You're going to read some stuff in there that you're not going to like. So I just want to prepare you because we've dealt with a lot here. So it's traumatic. It's traumatic. And um, it was a time in my life. But the thing of the book that I want to really put forward to people that, yeah, you can go through these horrible, horrible times in your life. But you know what? You were slapped down, got up, wipe yourself off and move towards tomorrow. And that's what's important for me more than anything. I want to teach my 15 year old son that, look, no matter how much life beats you down, and it's not a self-help book at all. It, this is just my sure. story. I'm not preaching here. I just want to look. If I can, if one book could help one person in, in this life, we're all good, right? I want to teach my son. You can get slapped down. You brush yourself off and move towards tomorrow because that's what you got. And and you honestly have proved that with the band, especially uh, you know when you look at the trajectory of the band where you've gotten through so many different eras of music, whether it was when new metal was at the height of popularity and your type of music was not necessarily cool and the venues you were playing in got smaller. And totally. I saw myself that when you guys got back with Joey Belladonna, you're playing these massive places. You're playing Yankee Stadium for the big four. So I, you've truly lived that resilient attitude. Um, I think people, and, and maybe you'll answer some of this in the book, but We'll probably have questions of the for one, why was your brother murdered and why was the guy never caught? Well, I have to say this. They had a witness. Look, I grew up in the Bronx. I know the people around there. Here's what happens. You have a scene. It looks like it's and I, I I say this in the book, it's almost like a Scorsese movie, really. You have a scene in a Bronx scene. A lot of people hanging out outside a coffee shop. Apparently there was issues beforehand. There's a, there was a history there. It was, it was on, right? It was, it was on, you know what I'm talking about. So it was, um, it was meant to be that night, right? So um, the witnesses, there were witnesses, but nobody talked except one person. We went to the Bronx criminal courts, which is, please, I pray nobody ever has to go through that in their lifetime. Believe me, 
Talk about dragging you after the fact of the pain of losing a brother and family member. Then they drag you through like it's like rakes. It's just it's raking you through the streets. It, it's it's just horrible. They bring you to so many different court appearances where you have to be in the same room with these people. You know the assailant, the accused assailant, uh, and it's like a Scorsese movie. You know you got the bad guys on one side and you got the good guys on the other side. Bad guys that try to intimidate the good guys, and it gets ugly. The court the court cops come in, make sure there's peace because they know it's going to go. And it was just like that. And as honest as I could be, there were times where, you know, I remember the assailant, the accused assailant, just looking over to my family, just shoot. And I have that face in my head, my head right now as I speak to you, just almost like that. Imagine your brother just murdered, you just buried him, right? And then you see that. And yeah. how does that make you feel in your gut right there? That's what you live through. And um, that's... Well, I had to, that's why I went dark, to be honest. And it just, I just kind of snapped. It wasn't me. Um, it was just really tough to, to keep it together. And um, nothing ever happened. So they had this one witness that went for the preliminaries. But so the, the next week I got a call. Well, we all got a call from the detective on the case. I have some bad news. We lost the witness. Witness took off somewhere, never to be found again. So... There you go. You know, he's intimidated. He left. And uh, it's a cold case as we speak right now, which which hurts because I know so many people, you know, that know what happened. But, you know, again, this is why you have to move on. Uh, look, you have to move on and you, you put it in songs, put it in something creative if you could, whatever, to make you deal with, with life and find something creative in your life to make you deal with it. Uh, that's the only constructive thing I can say to do because that's the only thing that helped me. Because just to get out of that zone and say, look, I got to do something positive. Plus, I don't want to put this on my kid. I don't want to put this anger and rage that I have. I don't want to do that. And that's why it's, it's a big part of the book. Do you think there's any way that the book coming out will give you a, some closure, not just for yourself, but to actually finding this guy? Because we've heard so many cases in the forefront of the media in the past few years where someone is in prison for something they did decades ago uh you know bill cosby for example or now r kelly for things that he did over probably the past 20 years be just because it was now in the media and now that there was like a spotlight on this issue do you think it's possible people who have some knowledge are going to pick up this book and uh, you speak some more until this guy's put in prison well i think there's i i think there's a lot of ways to get out of a lot of you know in, in new york especially dude there's a lot of people who know a lot of people you know and, and, and I, I had to say i hate to sound so so inside, but the truth of the matter is that a lot of people would talk to, and even the detective told me, um, he knew a lot of people and, uh, he got out of it and that's good. You know what? Cause I believe in karma. I believe in what comes around, goes around and it's all good. And what I won't do is live on this. I won't because that will affect my relationship with my son. And that's the whole thing. This is, this book is about, you know, moving on in your life and brushing yourself off and, and. Look, abandonment, I won't do what I did to my, my father did to my, me and my family to my son. I won't let that happen because I have scars and I don't want that to happen. I won't bring my scars into his life. It doesn't make sense to me. So, because I was the, I was that kid and it doesn't work for me. I want to be better than that. And that's what, that's what it's taught me. And that's, that's what I say in the book. And, um, it's, you know, talking about this stuff is really cathartic. It really is because out of all the therapy, you know, I've gotten some answers of why I think the way I think uh, and how to think really and, and what's the more positive way to go. Because the negative, look, at the end of the day, you can go either way. The negative makes you feel like shit. I was tired. I was there for a long time. So yeah. I'm no angel. I was there for a long time. But I'll be honest, it doesn't feel good. And you have this much life in our span of life. I want to use it to feel good. And that's the truth. So I want to find ways to make me feel good at this point. And if the book could help people feel good after a traumatic episode in their life, that's important to me. Yeah. Do, do you want to get into the issues with your father? Because that seems like that's another major point of the book. And, and also now your relationship with your son. And, and I'm even wondering, was your son born after you went through this? Oh, yeah. Before? I'd love to hear the time span of that. My son is 15. So it's way after everything. So look, I was 10 years old. Um, my dad just took off. Look, and I don't even know the reason why. I don't know. To, to be honest, it's never been told to me. So it's fine, right? That's the way I deal with it. 
but I was the oldest of a family of five. My brother Anthony, who, was, who passed, was six months old. He was a baby. So I'll never understand that logic. Fine, people have their reasons. Whatever you do, you do. But I'm on the other side. The book is about I. this is what happens. This is what happens after you go through this scarring time and this insecurity and looking for things and why do I feel this way? And you don't have the backbone for maybe a, a couple of words of wisdom from a dad would give you, right? To give you that backbone, like getting beat up in school because I didn't have the backbone to stand up for myself. You know what I mean? Being bullied and stuff because I didn't have the backbone to stand. All that stuff can be inserted into from a dad, right? And and it's a, this book is a tribute to the, the strong women in my life because those are the ones who, my mother, my grandmother, my aunt, my aunts, those are the people who took the ball and ran with it. So it's a tribute to them, not only my brother, um, but it's it's really, I'm a, I'm a pro girl thing, you know, because I'm a pro girl guy because they really stepped up and took that, both, both roles really. And um, I believe in that. So yeah, so I don't understand that whole thing, the abandonment thing, because you brought people into the world. You don't just leave them. And that's that's my whole thing. And that's why it's a big deal with the book. And the one thing I won't do, it doesn't matter in life. For me, I can't even touch that with my son. I won't even, the thought would never even come because that's first and foremost before music, before anything else, before Frank, that Brandon, my son Brandon is more important than anything. And that's it for me. Look, the rest of the time I have on earth, whatever it is, that's what I'm dedicated to. That's it, making his life better. And so he can achieve whatever he wants to in his life, period. I was probably around your son's age, I think, when I got into Anthrax. So it makes me wonder, is he into his dad's music? Does, does he like yes. getting to see you rock out on stage? He loves it. And, the, you know, I have an appearance on Friday um, in the city for the book. And um, he's coming. And I'm just doing this, some acoustic songs. I'm going to talk about the book. We're doing this stuff. and I'm going to be playing some songs. And he wants to come just to see that. So, you know, and he's right on the, on the edge and I could see it. He sings a lot in the house, right? But he, I, I leave guitars all around, dude. I leave guitars just to inspire. Not to, I'm not. Yeah, I mean, people won't see the video, but you got your guitars and your basses yeah. right behind you. I and and I can tell that's a purpose. whole recording setup. On total purpose, because I want to inspire him because music has been such an outlet for me when times aren't so good. I want him to have that tool in his life. So when he has a bad day, I want him to pick up a guitar and get it out of him. I mean, it, it did that for me and it still does to, to the, today. I wanna give him that tool and he does it with singing because I can hear him, he has a really nice voice. Uh, but I, I say, look, you wanna play? I'll help you with it, whatever you want, but I'm not forcing you to play, but you should play. Here's why, it's a tool. And, I, and that's it, I'm leaving it there. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, you have to do this, I'm not that guy. I wanna do it, but I am enticing around the house, you know, leaving different instruments around. And whenever, if he picks one up, all good. It, it almost sounds like there might be a future thing with you and him the way there was with Eddie Van Halen and his son, get, hey, you know, to getting to do their thing on stage. I'm all about it. You know, my, my guitar player, Scott, he has a son that's a great rebel. His, he's a great musician. He's playing already. He's young. He's younger than Brandon. He's playing already. He's a great musician. Uh, Charlie, Charlie's daughter, um, Mia, she plays piano. So we're all very proud parents. See, my band, Anthrax, we're very proud parents. And all the guys in my band, well, there's only three of us that have children, are all, and I consider us great dads. I'm very proud of that. All three of us really, you know, we, we go above and beyond. I think that's important. That's where we came from. It's, it's very important. Are you guys still also great friends? Because I huh. think the illusion, a lot of these bands, when we see them on stage or, oh, they, they, they're getting along. I mean, it's crazy to me. I just mentioned Van Halen, the fact that there was so much turmoil in that, that band, because when I would see them live, they look like they were having the time of their life. If you looked at Diamond Dave's face and Wolfgang's face and Eddie Van Halen, and it was almost kind of a letdown when you would see in interviews them saying, yeah, we don't really like each other. And, uh, you know, you hear about these things with different bands. Everybody's on a different tour bus and everybody has their own entourage. And it's not necessarily the brotherhood we would like it to be. And it's more of a business. So, yeah, I wonder if you guys get along. I, yeah, I, I, as honest as I can be with you, Ian, it's, it's the same. Look, we all have, look, we know angels. We do argue. Songwriting, stuff like that, that happens. But you got to realize that 40 years together, we've been together longer than with our families. I know, I mean, Scott, literally, I mean, and Charlie, we've been to. I grew up in the same house as Charlie, and that's all in the book too. But we grew up together uh, on the road. 
So, I mean, there were, there were times we went home for months at a time, months on, we were on tour. So I spent a lot more time with Scott, Charlie, you know, and Joey than with a lot of people in my life. So yeah, we're tight. And, uh, look, and again, peaks and valleys, right? You have disagreements like every family member would. The whole, the truth of the matter is you have to get through that. That's why bands break up. Cause you don't, you know, you don't talk about it. If you don't talk about it and get shit out, it doesn't work, but um, we found a way to do it. We know this works, and that's the most important part. This this band works, um, and we know when we get together on stage, there's a magic there that can't be touched for us, so um, it, it, it's that important. I hope that you guys are enjoying this interview thus far. The, the best thing about doing this show is when guys are completely candid about their life and, and what they've experienced, and I have to say Frank really was completely candid during this interview, and uh, I hope you guys appreciate it. I sure appreciated him being so forthcoming about these really uh, tragic experiences in his life, but also the inspiring story of overcoming as you're hearing. We get into a whole lot more, but before we do, I want to tell you about some more people who keep us going and they do some great work. Photonist Defense is the global leader in night vision solutions, providing more high quality night vision capabilities than anyone. Hunters, shooters, boaters, and outdoor enthusiasts rely on Photonist Defense systems to make their adventures safer and more successful. Military, law enforcement, and public safety end users utilize Photonist Defense Solutions to give them the edge at night in tactical situations and rescue operations. Photonist Defense is now offering state-of-the-art night vision systems from the PD-Pro-B 16mm binocular and the PD-Pro-M 16mm monocular to the PD-Pro-Q panoramic night vision system Customers from all over are excited about these new, smaller, lighter NVGs. You have got to see these things to really experience how much smaller and lighter they are than anything you have used previously. And I'll tell you what I'm excited for. I'm excited to meet the team over at Photonis uh, in just a couple of months, in just uh, really January, three months from now. Uh, at SHOT Show in Vegas. It's going to be a blast if you're there. Check out the Photonist Defense booth and you'll get to meet the team over there. Exciting stuff. And check out our episode with Phil Otto if you want to learn a little bit more about what Photonist Defense is doing. That was recently on the show, so you'll see that on the archive. But visit photonistdefense.com for more information or look for Photonist Defense product options from your night vision dealer. That's P H O. T-O-N-I-S defense.com. As always, link is right there in the description. Check them out. And what good is night vision if you don't have the best ammo? And that's why we are proud to be sponsored by Fort Scott Munitions. Fort Scott is a manufacturer of multi-federal patented solid copper and brass CNC spun ammunition that is designed to tumble upon impact in soft tissue leaving devastating wound channels for faster bleed-out and quicker incapacitation. This ammunition was originally developed to innovate and improve on the standard of military-grade ammunition design. It was found that not only did the TUI ammunition outperform competitors in the self-defense industry, but it quickly became apparent that it would be a top contender for hunters alike. With the ammunition being CNC spun, the tolerances are some of the tightest on the market, ensuring that you receive the same results with each pull of the trigger. Fort Scott Munitions is available throughout privately owned businesses in all 50 states. Just go to their website, click on the dealer locator, and you're going to find somewhere that sells Fort Scott Munitions right by you. That's fortscottmunitions.com, F O R T. S-C-O-T-T-M-U-N-I-T-I-O-N-S dot com and uh, check them regularly because every now and again you're going to see some great deals on bulk ammo and when you do you can use our promo code BATTLELINE for 15% off your order and you'll really save a lot on those bulk orders as well as their merch, the Tactus Squatch shirt, the trucker hats, all that good stuff only available to listeners to the BATTLELINE podcast Fort Scott Munitions is a proud supporter of Chris Peranto, Battleline Tactical, and the Battleline Podcast. FortScottMunitions.com, promo code BATTLELINE. Link is right there in the description. Let's get right back to Frank Bello, 
bass player extraordinaire, and now author. Check it out. Yeah, one thing I didn't know until I was doing some of my own research, though, and it's because you're on every single Anthrax album from the point you joined the band except to the now. First one. Except the first one, yeah. Except that's what that's yeah. why I said from the point from, you joined the, the band. Joined, yeah, good job. <laughs> to, to now. Um, but there apparently, and I was unaware, this was a very, very brief period where you left the band, but you didn't put out any music. Is that correct? I left, um, well, you know, there were, and we're talking about this just now. There was a time where we needed a break from each other because there was, you know, disagreements between Charlie, myself, and Scott. And we agreed, look, I didn't quit and I wasn't fired. We just needed space. And that's what was happening. So we needed space. So my friend Joey Vera from Armored Saint, who I love, is one of my better friends in life. He came in and took the place uh, of the bass player for, for Anthrax, which is great. And I loved it. Uh, I just took a couple of weeks off. And my friend Johnny Tempesta was playing with Helmet at the time. And he calls he calls me up. He says, what are you doing? I said, just just get my head together. Come on out and jam. They're looking for a bass player. So I went out and I was a big Helmet fan, diehard Helmet fan. Anyway, so yeah, I said, this would be fun. Johnny, I grew up with Johnny. I went to high school with him. It all made sense to me. I went out and um, learned a whole bunch of songs. And uh, it just, as soon as we started to jam together, Paige and Chris and, and John, it was obvious. This is going to be a ball. We're going to have a good time. And and it was a great challenge because I was playing with a pick and it was bass oriented stuff. And I loved it. And, and I did about a year and a half to two years on that. It was a lot of fun. Uh, and then we came back into the reunion of Anthrax. You know, and that was a hard decision to leave Helmet, to go back. But I knew I had to because it, I felt like there was something that was left undone with anthrax so i thought it was important and i'm glad we did because i think we we settled a lot of stuff and um we talked it all out and it all worked out well and this is why we're still going right now yeah i mean because you are one of the few bands who has these three classic um well i should really say four classic members and you've you've changed between um singers as i said before yeah but yeah that there's something to be said there's so many bands now that are touring from your era and it's one band member left or two band members left. And it's not necessarily the same band. I mean, we've seen bands where it's it's just the drummer touring is the band's name. He has the rights to the name. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole point, though. We're lucky enough. Pray, pray we all stay healthy enough to do this. Um, and that's another factor as you get older. You, you, you know, we have to stay in shape. I'm a yoga guy, blah, blah, blah. We all do this stuff to, get in, to be able to play on stage and be able to do this. Um, and that's an important factor. But, yeah, I mean... I don't think of anything else I, that I would rather do right now because this this is just a ball and the anticipation now for the new the new era of anthrax because of what just happened. Number one, we, before we went into COVID, there wasn't a record. I think it was four years, and now it's 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 going to be five or six years now. Um, but I look forward to a new record and a new touring cycle and all of that, and just to seeing people and, and you know so. There's an anticipation that's building that I love in everybody, not only the band, but people, fans. So I'm looking forward to it. What What was the process, I'm wondering, of getting Joey Belladonna back in the band? Because I think there was always that hope for a lot of fans of, are they ever going to tour with this guy again? And then at the same time, I think some fans were, uh, they thought it was kind of strange that it was just, you had this guy in the band for probably a good uh, around 15 years. And then all of a sudden it's done. We're going back to the old school. And, and for the most part, you didn't really look back from there. Right. Well, that again, you know, this is, is that stuff like that. It needs to happen in a band where things aren't working anymore. Well, with John, I, I don't think he wanted to do it a lot. He didn't want to tour a lot anymore. And look, I love John Bush. You have to understand that. You know, we're all good friends. Um, but sometimes in bands, this is what happens. This is what I've learned as a fan in a band, right? This shit happens. And you got to roll with the punches and see where it goes. And that's what we did. So when, when Joey came back, it was great. It, it made sense. It made sense what we were doing. Um, and the good thing about it is nobody's hurt. You know what I mean? Nobody's Nobody hurts from this stuff. John's good. Love is last Armored Saint record rocks. It's great. Great stuff. Joey's singing great with us. So, I mean, it's it's good all around. So, I mean, I know people and the trolls are going to try and ding it to the negative stuff. I'm not into it. I don't care. I don't care. You know, at the end of the day, what makes me happy is this band rocking and, and really putting out a great record, playing great shows. You know, it's it's been a great ride. And I, I just don't look back. I honestly don't. 
I, I mean, as a fan, you could tell it, at that time, that's what fans were hungry for, though, because I saw you during the We've Come For You All, you all tour um, at the downtown right here on Long Island. Oh, yeah. Much smaller venue, had a great time, but, you know, packed smaller venue. And then you look from there to a few years later, I got to see the reunion with Joey Belladonna at what was Nokia Theater Times right. Square, then PlayStation Theater, unfortunately, no longer there. That was a fun show, yeah. Great show, yeah. but much bigger venue, yeah. entirely packed. Great lineup. Sworn Enemy was oh, on there. Good friends of uh, mine. I love those guys. Love those and uh, God Forbid was on there, right? I, I think they were on too, right, right. Yeah, God Forbid. Another great band, um, yep. Uh, of course, and now um, Doc now doing his thing in Bad Wolves, of and they've been killing Love it. Doc. But I, I mean, there was a reason that you were playing bigger venues and then eventually stadiums with Joey Belladonna. It was something the people wanted to see. Well, again, this is all matter of fact. For me, it's the ne next progression of Anthrax. I look at it as a storyline, right? I look at my whole life with Anthrax storyline. This is what happened here. This is, what, but it's a fun story to look at. If you look at it. In, in that length of time from 19, when I, when I joined the when 1984, my God, and the progression going, yeah, to John, the John Bush era, it was a great time. It was a great time. And then going back into the Joey thing, it, I, I think we've been very lucky, to be honest, and very fortunate. And I'm thankful and grateful to the fans for staying with us because the one thing you can expect out of Anthrax is consistency in the music. And that's one thing we've always done. And I'm proud of, I'm proud to say that. So, uh, I think we've had two different bands, two different anthraxes, which I'm very proud of in my life. I have to ask, though, what was up with this very strange, short-lived period where there was going to be a third singer in the mix? Because I think fans were thinking, anthrax is John Bush or Joey Belladonna, and I don't think Legally, they were so quick to accept the third guy. Legally, I can't talk about that. Okay. I, know, okay. I have to stop that there. I, honestly, I can't. Legally, okay. I can't. All right. Understandable. I just, I figured I would ask because I think that people love these two different eras. And I think for the fans, they they were, I don't know, they just weren't as quick to, to get into something like that. You know what I'm wondering with the band, like I said, there, there's been so many different periods of the band. I mean, you were probably really one of the first, you could, I know you could say Faith No More in bands like that, but to introduce a rap sound into metal with what you did with Public Enemy um, as I said, these different albums like Stomp 442, which were a totally different sound for you guys. What was like your favorite album of the band and what what is your least favorite? You know, they're all your babies. You have to understand. Everybody says that when you're a writer and you, you do this, uh, you do records. Um, I, I don't have a, a, a least favorite, but if you have to ask what's your least favorite, just because, and I say this in other interviews, so it's out there. Um, is some songs on State of Euphoria that I wish we had more time with. But that's all. That's in our, in our whole career. That was a time of touring, of touring record, touring record. I don't think we had enough time until that next tour started because it was happening really quick. And we wanted more time to digest the songs. I think just a couple of songs in that record, for me personally. Um, but again, it's still a great record, State of Euphoria. I love it. I do love it. And it's fun to play those songs. But there's just a couple of songs on that record that I wish we had more time to digest and live with for a while because I think we would have made some changes for the better of the song. And that's it. Because when we play it, when I when I hear it and I jam it, man, I wish we did that there. And I never want to say that because usually, like right now with the process of writing, you just digest things and we live with it. And if something's not right, we know it because we live with it. And then you come back with something better and maybe a different part to it. And that's it. That's really all I meant with that. But everything else I'm very, very proud of. And um, and the great thing about it is having this catalog that people are asking about. People are asking to pull back songs. And I love that. That's that's the biggest compliment, that you want to hear some some songs from those 80s records. I love it, man. Come on. Of course. It's the best compliment. So your what about your favorite, then? Yeah. You know, it's hard to pick. I'm being honest with you. Uh, all right. It's, it's really hard because people want to say Among the Living, and I love Among the Living, but my favorite is For All Kings because I think we know who we are, songwriters, all that stuff. I think we know to pick and choose. We have lived with that record, all the songs before we put it out. Um, it's really hard. Worship music, another, another great one for me. Um, and then you go spreading the disease, right? Among the Living, I love those. Those are times of me growing up, so it was very precious to me, very precious to me. My first record, you know, 
the Armed and Dangerous EP. See, for me, that you can't let go. You can't let go because they're all your. It's my. It's the scrapbook of my life. You know, so it's really hard to pick. But if you had to ask me, you know, right now because I'm listening to worship music because I love those songs. Yeah, that's what's on in my head right now. But uh, there's a lot of great stuff. I'm very proud of that. Yeah, I have to say I am surprised to hear State of Euphoria, though, as the one that you have the most issue with, just because I think for the fans, that's an album that the fans consider a classic. And the albums that were a little bit more panned by the fans were like Stomp 442, which I think is a great album. But I was I was thinking I was going to hear one of those albums from that era. Oh, okay. No, no, you're not proud of those records, too. I'm just saying, if you go back and say, I wish, because I know the time process there. We just didn't, there wasn't enough time and we should have just ignored that next tour coming out. We should have taken more time. Just with a couple of those songs. And I'm not saying the whole record. There's a couple of songs in that record that just, oh man, just right there, right there. And maybe I'm too nitpicky too, because it is a great record, but there's a couple of songs that I just wanted more time for the band to just do work on a little bit more. So being that this is, you know, a military oriented show, and I, I usually do the show with Chris Peranto, which if you know his background, survived the Benghazi attack, Army Ranger. Awesome. Um, yeah, all around great guy, but it is, is doing a speech today. So I had to switch it up and bring you on. But we, awesome. we've had different musicians on the show, uh, guys like Ted Nugent, guys like uh, I'm wearing my Amir shirt, Frankie Palmieri awesome. from Amir. Oh. And whenever I have uh, musicians on the show, I, I do ask the question of, uh, and I know that you've experienced this, but what it's like when you have guys who have served in combat or uh, have been deployed and they said Anthrax was either, you know, the soundtrack to that or, or it got them through it. I, I just would love to hear from your perspective some of those stories and how it made you feel. Well, you have to understand my, my Uncle Johnny, who's now passed, um, served in Vietnam. Um, my Uncle Dom did, too. So um, I this is nothing but respect and love and admiration for people that would protect us. That's the bottom line, you know, give their lives for us. And I, I, I love that. Um, any show, any, any service person that wants to come to an anthrax show, please let me know. You're, you know, you're in, uh, that's as far as I'm concerned. But, uh, when they come up to us and say they're, they're mu our music help them get through a day, you have to understand how that feels because I know what you guys are doing and thank you for it. Thank you for your service. I want to say it to everybody out there. Thank you for your service for, for making us feel safe. Thank you. Um, you have to understand that that makes us feel it, it. That's the reason why we do it to make people feel that that you felt and it gets you through it. Whatever that, whatever, whatever that gut feeling that you have, that energy that's coming out right there, and and it's satisfying that angst in you. That's what it means to to me. That's what it, it still does that to me. So when I have servicemen come up to us and say, "You guys got us through with your songs," and look, I would love to play play some of these shows that we never i know with the name anthrax it's a little bit weird right <laughs> but i would love to play for the servicemen uh, and, and service women i would love that it would be awesome and uh because what's the better thank you than that right but we've never been asked we've never been asked for that and uh we would love to it would be awesome it's interesting because i've heard that from other guys on the show too like we had dave silvera formerly from corn on here and dave silvera is a huge supporter of the military oh, and he's like yeah i would love to play these military bases but we, we never got the opportunity. I know. It's the name Anthrax. I get it. I get it. But <laughs> you no, know, it has nothing to do with that. It's, we're trying to make a good name, right? And we want to play. It would be awesome. But honestly, we've never been asked. And it would be a pleasure and an, an honor to do that. So, um, you know, the door's always open for that one. So if they <laughs> if they get to change that, uh, you know, the ideology of the old Anthrax thing, I'm all in, though, dude. Dude, I still remember um, during that whole anthrax scare when you put out the press release that said we are changing our name to Basketball of Puppies. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're no longer going to go by anthrax. And then I love that shot of you coming out at the show with the weird, we're not changing our names. And that makes me think that was actually, we were talking about Eddie Trunk, it goes full circle. I think that was at the show that Eddie Trunk hosted yeah. with you guys, right? Yeah. It was. And Eddie, Eddie did a great job with that. You know, New York Steel, it was called. And, uh, first responders and it was it was incredible because people were saying you, you know the news was saying you're going to change our names we're not going to that was a scott said it in jest they went on the cnn ticker yeah went all along of course we weren't <laughs> do that, but you know it got crazy for a while there so we came out with these white suits on white jumpsuits and everybody had a word we're not going to change our names and the crowd went they erupted 
enormously. It was incredible. It was an incredible feeling. And uh, even before the show, going up to the stage, all the all the firemen and firewomen and policemen, police women coming up to us, uh, saying, "Don't change your name. Don't make them win." You know, the, it was it was an incredible feeling. It really was. So it was it was it was it was a great night, and it was a great cause, and it felt really it was powerful, powerful man. That's amazing. I'll have to put up a picture of the we're not changing our names because that's such an iconic. It was awesome. I loved it. Yeah, photo. I feel like with the jumpsuits, that was so still cool. feel it and, when you see that picture. It's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. I I love that whole era of the band. I mean, if I was to tell you my favorite album from the band, it probably is We Have Come For You All. Wow, and cool. I, I, yeah, I love it. And, and I think it's because of the time frame, too. That For me, that was when I was in high school and when I was at the peak of getting into the band. And for it was the first new Anthrax release for me. I remember going to Best Buy and buying the CD. And I, even, I remember everything when I buy CDs. Awesome. Like, I remember I had this k-rock card that you got a discount for if you purchased with this like k-rock membership card and putting it in and it was just start to finish such a great album um i have no idea how much you're involved in the lyric writing or anything like that but the interesting thing with that album is anthrax to me has never been a political band it's never what you guys have been about but there is one song in that album that song refused to be denied uh, which maybe I'll play in the background here, but like it starts with that awesome scream from the um, lead singer of E Town Concrete, awesome. I know. <laughs> But then the, uh, yeah, the, yeah, and the, the first lines of that out of that song are, are proud and free. That's American to me. That's American to me. And and I feel like that was post 9/11, at least from my years, sounded like a very pro America song. Is that what the message you guys were well, with that? Scott song? writes the lyrics in the band, and I'm proud to say he writes some great lyrics. Yeah, um, so he would know detail uh, about what he meant on it. For me, that's what it meant: is like coming out strong, you know. And if you, even the riff alone is just it's so freaking heavy. That that's one of my favorite songs of Anthrax. It's like not a lot of people know about. You know, it's weird. Not yeah. people mention that song, but it's it's one of the heavier stuff stuff we've come out with. I think. Not a, I don't know how many people have heard that record, right? So um, it's it, one of my. It favorites. definitely is one of the heavier, like because, like I said, that scream with Anthony yeah. from awesome. E Town Concrete. Because awesome. I I remember when I heard it, I was like, who is that? Because you know that's that's not John Bush. No. It's just not the way he sounds. Yeah. So I knew it was from someone else, and he he killed it. I think he anybody. Did who's a fan of the heavier genre, if they put that in, they'll go, this is Anthrax? Like, it was a totally new sound. Dude, you had to hear, you had to see him do it live, like, in the studio. It was like this all air. Wow. I was like, oh, my <laughs> God. It was incredible. It was incredible. Fun. Great stuff. Yeah, I I, I think, and you guys have kind of captured this, this with the newer albums, like you said, like, worship music, but even the cover, the you guys as superheroes on the cover of that album, yeah. it was epic. Uh, just thing to look at. Like I was, I was so excited because those were the days where you, as I said, bought the CD and you opened it up and it was an event. And and that has all kind of changed. That was that was the tail end of of all of that. Right. And you know, it's something. It's it's an experience that we miss. And I feel bad for people. You know, younger people now don't get that experience. And we we were lucky enough to have that whole open open the album, and and just live. You know, look at the back of it and just. You know, I remember opening Kiss records and stuff. And my God, it was so great to have the whole experience of the, the detail about the, the marketing and, and what they put in. Kiss used to put Love Gun, like the Love Gun in, in the record. I mean, it was so cool, man. Um, I, I, we, our, our drummer, Charlie Benetti, is a great artist. And he's, he does most of the artwork for this band. And he comes up with great ideas. So um, we usually go with what he says uh, when he brings it to us. It's a yay or nay, but it's usually a yay because it's so good. And he, it's just incredible. So we follow suit with that. So he didn't he didn't draw that though, did he? No. No. Okay. Yeah. Because when you said he was a great he artist. Designs, um, he designs a lot of he's a great artist in his own right, believe me. If you've seen his work, he's he's awesome. Well, I don't want to keep you here too long. I one thing I'll say is that when you talk about um opening up the package, I think with vinyl coming back and all that, some people are reliving that again. Yeah. Even some younger kids who didn't get to experience that. But I still like the physical product. I mean, as I said, I saw Born of Osiris last night. I never ended up getting the album. So, you know, I picked it up and it's there you a go. cool digi pack and everything. And so that still excites me. I'm still this 13 year old kid who gets excited. Me too. I love that stuff. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. I love opening and just exploring because you're listening to it and you, you, you're you living through it. I love it. It's, it's a whole experience there that I want people to see. Yeah, I fully agree. And it's becoming less and less, unfortunately. A lot of albums now you are only available digital or streaming. I'm seeing more of, and I think you should give fans the option of all of that stuff. Um, but the last thing I actually do want to ask you, you mentioned um, Kiss, and people should know that the, the uh, forward for this book is none other than the great Gene Simmons. How did that happen? Is that the New York connection? Because I know all you guys were huge Kiss fans. I know Scott Ian's got the the tattoos of all the of makeup. So yeah. Well, we're diehard Kiss fans, as everybody knows. It's been well documented. But look, uh, I have a long history with Kiss because I'm a New Yorker. And, uh, and when I was younger, this is all in the book, these stories. Uh, we used to go downtown. My friend Tom and I, we used to go downtown and Kiss in the 70s. Nobody knew what they looked like. So we used to go downtown to their management office because we knew where their management was. And Tommy got a call. He had some kind of inside info and he got a call like, they're going to come in for a meeting today. We would go downtown, go downtown, wait in front of their management office. And this is January, February, freezing our asses off, waiting for these guys that we really didn't know what they looked like because they always covered their faces because those were the days when Kiss didn't, nobody knew what the Kiss looked like. So we would look for guys with six foot and above, with long, long hair uh, and uh, high heels on. And we wait for them to walk into the, and that's how we knew it was Kiss. And so we got to know these guys after a while because we were there so often, signing the same autograph a thousand times. And we, but we weren't there for the autograph. We were there for information about Kiss. What's the next record like? What's the next tour like? What's the next staging like? What's the next makeup like? Costumes. We got everything, and it's it, it all comes around in a circle because Gene Gene Simmons, who writes a beautiful beautiful forward, uh, I'm very proud of it in my book. Uh, it talks about his his dad uh, in ways that I've never heard him talk about it, and uh, it's really touching. Um, so Gene still remembers those stories. Me as a kid coming up to him in the management offices. That's how great his mind is and his memory. So it all comes around full circle to have him. And uh, Joel MacGyver, my co-writer, um, who, who's awesome, uh, he actually asked Gene because I was said, I don't think Gene would say yes. Gene said yes. I, I couldn't believe. It. And then when I read it, I was blown away. And I'm, I'm very humbled and honored to have him write the forward. Yeah, that that's incredible. And I think people are going to see that. And and between that and the stories, people are going to want to pick up this book. So once again, it's Fathers, Brothers, and Sons, Surviving Anguish and Abandonment and Anthrax. It's out now. This show is going up on Monday. So tomorrow, the Audible version will be out. And uh, Audible is actually yes. a sponsor of ours. So I'm wondering, do you read the book? I do read the book. It's totally in nice. my accent. Everything is straight out and me living. For me, I was reliving that stuff. So, um, yeah, the, the guy recording it was laughing a lot. So there you go. <laughs> that, that's um, that's the way to do it. I had to. So we recently had this guy on, Dr. Donnelly Wilkes, and I had to break his balls a little bit because he got some voice actor to do it. And I'm like, you know, people want to hear you, man. And, and yeah. it you does feel take it, some time. I mean, I've recorded audio books. I know it takes time to get everything perfect. And it's a process. Oh, yeah. it's and, it's but I think it's, it's worth tedious. it. I think people. Yeah, if, if I am listening to Frank Bellow's book, I want to hear Frank Bellow. You'll hear it, man. And, and you know what? I, it was tedious and every little, you know, the diction and everything. Look, I have a New York accent. I get it. But at the, the idea was I wanted people to live it with me. I thought it was really important. I wanted to take you on the, the, the journey with me, really, my, about my life. It's my life. So it made all the sense in the world. I'm talking to the reader. You're my, you're my friend. I, the whole idea of this book was to sit. And I say this in a lot of interviews. When I talked to Joel MacGyver, my co-writer, I said, look, I want to have it where we're at a bar together and I'm telling you the story of my life. And a lot of the reviews are positive. Thank God they're all positive and people digging the book. They're all saying it comes across like that. And that means everything to me. So I just want to connect, man. It's not, not Frank here and you here. No, we're hanging at a bar, man. That's what it's supposed to be. Yeah, I uh, I should say I had more of a New York accent when I first started in radio and, and probably doing one of my first ever interviews with Joey Belladonna. Uh, and this was probably 2006 or 2007. And then up to more recently, maybe three years ago or so, I got the chance to interview Charlie Benanti doing um, Appetite for Distortion, which is a Guns N' Roses podcast. And now to you. So I've interviewed three of the four classic members in this span of this 15 plus career uh, year, uh, 15 plus year career in radio, which is just an honor for cool, me. Um, and for all different, very different circumstances for, you know, 
Joey was touring at the time and Charlie was promoting different things with anthrax. And for you, it's really this new book as well as celebrating these 40 years of anthrax. Um, so go to uh, anthrax.com to see what you guys are up to that European tour as well. Uh, the Frank Bellow.com the Frank Bellow on Twitter and on Instagram. You're also on cameo cameo.com slash Bellow. If you want to get a birthday or any greeting like that, shout outs. You want to scream at people, uh, do it all. It's, it's always fun to do that. I'm having a ball with them. Why not? Let's just do it. Well, this was an absolute honor. And as I said, kind of early on the show, I knew this was going to fly by and I had so many different questions <laughs> about the history of this band. And I, I really appreciate you being candid. And I think this book I, when I heard that you were on Eddie Trunk, I didn't really know what to expect. I figured maybe this might just be another book of growing up, joining a band, honestly hooking up with groupies and, and touring an album. And, and you can tell this is not that book. No. And you know what? I'm, get, I'm getting hit up uh, with a lot of people saying thank you for because they're reading it now, which is nice. And it's saying it helped them with their trauma, and which is really nice to hear because, look, there's a lot of I've dealt with loss, dealt with pain. Uh, my, my whole thing is for this, it's not just a rock. There's a great rock and roll stories book, rock and roll stories in this book. Yes. And Kiss, Pantera, you know, all that stuff. Metallica, great stuff, hanging out with them, backstage stuff. That's all in it. But more importantly for me was to show people that, yeah, you go through some rough times in your life, peaks and valleys, brush yourself off, move towards tomorrow. That's what it's about. Well, I, I really appreciate you going the full hour with me and, you know, I don't even need to say good luck on this book. This book is going to be a massive success. And I think oh, rock you. fans and even people who probably never took the time to listen to Anthrax are going to love it. Great. I, I hope so. Like, If it helps one person, one person gets the book and can make them feel better about tomorrow, then the book has done its job. That's really the essence of the book. That's what I wanted to do. It's important. That's amazing. So, you know what? I'll throw out one last plug here. Like I said, if you go to um, battlelinepodcast.com slash audible, you'll be able to listen to the book for free. We have basically a 30-day trial for listeners. Awesome. And if you want to check this out, yeah, check out Frank's book. It'll be up tomorrow on Audible. I love that. I didn't even know that. Very cool. Thank you for that, man. Very cool. That's all for this episode of the Battle Line Podcast. But we'll be back on Monday with more American Straight Talk. Until then, be sure to follow us on Instagram at Battle Line Podcast and on Twitter at Battle Line Pod. To sign up for future Battle Line tactical courses, go to www.christantoperanto.net. Believe in yourself, face all challenges head on, and as always, never, never quit. quit.